Most people don't realize how many secrets the Bible's creation story really holds. What in the world? It seems like a simple story, but under close examination, it quickly becomes the Bible's most complicated and fascinating story. Case in point, the second verse of Genesis chapter 1 contains a big secret. It's almost invisible in English, but in the original Hebrew language, something scary lurks. Let's see if you can catch where it's hiding. Genesis chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 read, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was void and without form, and darkness hovered over the face of the deep. Can you guess? It's a phrase called the deep. In Hebrew, it says tehom, a word derived from the name of a Babylonian god, Tiamat, the chaos dragon that represented the sea. If you're someone like me and you take the Bible seriously, well, you might be feeling a little bit uncomfortable. Some scholars tend to jump to conclusions when they discover this, and they'll say the Bible plagiarized other ancient sources. But there might actually be a better explanation for why this is here, one that does not undermine the story of the Bible. In fact, Genesis 1 might be one of the most amazing literary works of all history. What if the author, Genesis 1, had a brilliant strategy here? Let's investigate. Some scholars say Genesis 1 verse 2 references the Babylonian creation story, Enuma Elish. In this story, the Babylonian storm god Marduk was said to have created the earth by killing Tiamat, the personification of chaos. He split her corpse in half. One half of Tiamat's corpse became the heavens, while the other half became the earth. Is the author of Genesis trying to utilize this story for some reason? Depends on who you ask. One view put forth by word biblical commentary is that the phrase the deep meant something else to a Hebrew person, a flood. Only later in history did this word become associated with the god Tiamat. This is because Tiamat's name and the Hebrew word for the deep are independently derived from the same common Semitic root. This view believes the writer of Genesis 1 only meant to refer to a flood. The author did not mean to reference the Babylonian story. As it turns out, there's something slightly off about how Tiamat's name is spelled in Genesis 1 verse 2. The use of Tiamat's name is masculine. It should be feminine. So if the writer of Genesis 1 really meant to reference the Babylonian chaos dragon, wouldn't he have used the correct feminine etymology? Maybe there is no chaos dragon here. Whew. So we can go back to reading Genesis 1 the way we used to read it, right? Not so fast. Then scholars discovered something else. Canaanite literature from Ugarit the stories of the pagans who lived in the land of the writer of Genesis 1, in the land of Abraham, Moses, the prophets. In a text called the Baal Cycle, the Hebrew word related to the deep appears again in reference to another chaos dragon. One thought to be referred to in the Bible's Psalm 74 under a different name. You might recognize it, Leviathan. In the Baal cycle, Baal killed Yom, the personification of the chaos of the sea, the deep, the equivalent to Leviathan, to bring chaos into order. Sound familiar? In Genesis 1 verse 2, God brought the chaotic sea to order. So now scholars think that the author of Genesis 1 was playing off of this Canaanite myth, just like the author of Psalm 74 did. It becomes difficult to escape the reality here that there are links between other religious myths and Genesis 1. After Genesis 1 verse 2, things get even more complex. There are more references to other mythologies of the area, too many to count. 
Egyptian, Akkadian, Phoenician, other possible Babylonian references. Most, if not all, of these other stories are older than Genesis chapter 1. So you can see how this would easily lead someone to conclude that Genesis 1 and the religion of the Bible evolved from older mythologies. When some Christians hear about this, they get nervous. They feel that they have to continue to believe Genesis 1 was written first, despite any textual or archaeological evidence. Otherwise, they'd feel they'd have to admit that Genesis 1 is just another myth. So who's right? Probably neither. There's a better solution for the person of faith and the skeptic. But what is it? Hold on to your hats. This ride is about to get wild. Take a deep breath. It's all going to be OK. The Babylonian Enuma Elish and Genesis 1 share a similar structure. And the vast majority of scholars agree that Genesis was written after Enuma Elish. The Enuma Elish was written on seven tablets, while Genesis 1's creation story features seven days of creation. In the Enuma Elish, the gods created humans to work the land and build Babylon on the sixth stone tablet. That's where this is written. Then the gods rested while humans worked as their slaves. Interesting parallel to the Sabbath in Genesis, right? In Genesis 1, humans were created on the sixth day. God rested on the seventh day. But there is a difference. Humans get to join God in resting on the Sabbath in Genesis. It doesn't stop there, though. Genesis 1 will go on to play off of other creation stories. In Genesis 1 verse 3, God spoke in order to create life. Over in Egyptian creation stories, the god Ptah was believed to have used speech to create. But wait, the author of Genesis replaced Ptah's name with God. Why? In verse 6, Genesis speaks of a dome over the earth. This could be a play on the Egyptian goddess Newt, whose body was thought to arch over the land to create the sky. Rain from heaven was thought to come from her breasts, while the waters were above the dome created by her body. But wait, the author of Genesis removed Newt from the story and instead wrote that God created the dome. Why? In verse 14, the stars are called signs for the seasons. The word used for signs is related to an Akkadian word for omens. Near Eastern literature wrote of the stars as gods, but the author of Genesis changed this to a more natural sense. Why? Back to Genesis 1 verse 2. Read through the Canaanite lens, Baal was said to have brought order to the cosmos by conquering Yom. But here in Genesis, God brought order to the cosmos. Yom, the sea dragon, is no threat at all. God seems to have control over the chaos. Hmm, what's going on here? Or if we read the same verse through the Babylonian lens, the Babylonian god Marduk was said to have created the heavens and the earth by conquering Tiamat, the personification of chaos known as the deep. But here in Genesis, chaos has been controlled by God. And Marduk wasn't needed to create the heavens and the earth. Instead, God did that without any cosmic battle taking place at all. Why? Maybe you're starting to see the writer's strategy here. In fact, almost every line of the creation story is a play on some other ancient creation story. Sumerian stories, Ugaritic stories, Mesopotamian stories, and we've already seen the Akkadian, Babylonian, and Egyptian stories here, all mixed together in one big pot of stew. What does it mean, though? Is it plagiarism, or is it something else, something smarter? If you're a person of faith, like me, well, you're probably really uncomfortable the first time you hear this. So it's time for me to explain my theory. There's a way to reconcile all of this, and it's not plagiarism. And I didn't make it up either. Scholars call what the author was doing interacting, interacting with other creation stories, other literature of the day, 
kind of like how we might reference a movie to make a point. It's a way to have a conversation with people who read these other stories being referenced with the intention of making a point, not inventing a new creation story. Because Genesis 1 interacts with so many other creation stories, scholars know Genesis 1 was likely written down after those stories were written. But that doesn't mean Genesis 1 didn't exist in a more basic form before it was written down. What's that you say? Enter the era of oral storytelling. The Genesis 1 creation story probably existed in some kind of oral version passed down through storytelling before it was written down. People didn't think to write things down during the storytelling era. That's not how they passed information on. But as humans began to write more and more things down instead of memorizing them, or just memorizing them, the time finally came to put the creation story down in a written form. And the author lived in a melting pot in the ancient Near East, surrounded by other religions and other cultures. He takes note of every person living in the area and how they think, what they read. And he realizes he needs to write something in a way that all of them can understand. He must figure out how to tell each and every one of them that God, Yahweh, is the true God, the creator of the universe who had been appearing to the Israelites after the other nations were scattered during the construction of the Tower of Babel. After Babel, according to the Bible, God stopped revealing himself to the other nations for a time because they wanted to pursue other gods. So God picked one nation, Israel, and tasked them with eventually telling the other nations about himself. The author of Genesis is sitting there pondering how to do that, how to communicate to these other nations. An Egyptian needs to be able to understand the story. A Babylonian's gonna read the story. They need to understand it. A Sumerian, and so on. So he uses their language, even quoting parts of their creation stories. Only he takes away the credit for creation from their gods, away from Tiamat, away from Marduk, away from Ptah, and he gives the credit for creation exclusively to God. It's called a polemic. It's a literary technique. It's a critique of every creation story in the region, an attempt to set the record straight. It is a form of literary criticism, but it's much more subtle and nuanced than, for example, Psalm 74, which metaphorically depicts God crushing the heads of Leviathan. So a basic story about God creating the universe already existed in storytelling form. But then it was formatted. All these details were put in to make specific points to the specific people living at that time. Think about how someone from one of these other cultures would have felt when they read Genesis 1. They look at it and then they'd say, oh, I know this story. Wait. This part's been changed. Why did the author do that? It seems intentional. Then by the time they got all the way down to verse 26 in Genesis 1, it says humans were made in the image of God. An ancient person thinks, wait, you mean if I serve this God, I'm not a slave? My creation story says the gods made me to be a slave. They didn't make me to be in a relationship with them. I have to barter with them out of fear. But this God seems different. My God sent a flood on the earth because humans were too loud and the gods couldn't sleep. So they tried to kill us all. But this God made us a partner in managing his creation. I have to barter with my God so my family won't be killed. I have to sacrifice my children so my family will live. But this God wants us to have a place in his family one day. Do you see? Do you see what the author of Genesis did? He weaved 
all of their literature together in a brilliant tapestry, the way you and I might quote a movie to make a point, but smarter. Some say it's plagiarism, but I say he probably came up with the most brilliant communication strategy you'll ever see. He just wasn't writing to people in the 21st century, so his brilliance kind of falls flat and, and goes invisible to us today. We speak in the language of science. He spoke a language of ancient literature and storytelling. Let's put a final bow on this mystery of the deep. What did the author of Genesis 1 really mean when he used this term? Was it intended to be read as Tiamat, Yam, or a flood? Was he writing to the Babylonian or the Canaanite or the Hebrew? Can we know for sure? With the current evidence, many scholars now think the author was most likely commenting on the Canaanite myth, the Baal cycle, just like the author of Psalm 74 did. But other scholars, such as Tim Mackey from The Bible Project, recognize that the phrase the deep can be read two ways. Even though the Hebrew word for the deep wasn't spelled quite right to directly match the name of the Babylonian god Tiamat, the two words are related, and the Babylonian would have understood this. They may have still recognized that the closest word they had to this term was the Babylonian god Tiamat, so they may have still understood Genesis 1 verse 2 as a reference to Tiamat. And maybe the author of Genesis 1 knew this, Maybe the Canaanite would read the phrase the deep and think of Yom, while the Babylonians would think of Tiamat. One phrase to speak to two different people groups. One verse to critique two different creation myths. No one knows for sure, but one thing seems clear. Genesis 1 is no evolution of mythologies or case of plagiarism. The author knew what everybody was reading at the time, and he used this knowledge to communicate a story that his people had been telling orally for hundreds of years. A story about one God who made humans not to be slaves, but to be trusted and cherished as family members. Let me know what you think about this in the comments. It was new to me, so I would imagine it's gonna be new to you. This channel is all about digging up the original context of the Bible and trying to understand the story as it was originally told. So if you wanna learn more together, hit subscribe, turn on notifications, and we'll see you next time.